So my name is Liz Ricketts, and I am the co-founder of the Or Foundation. We are a USA and Ghana based on profits. We've been working between those two countries since 2009, and we work at the intersection of environmental justice, education, and fashion development. I keep saying we because I'm joined today um, by two of my colleagues, Samuel and Chloe, who you're going to hear from soon. They actually pre-recorded some of their parts for the presentation just for connectivity reasons, um, but they are here with us, so you'll be able to engage directly with them during Q&A. And today, we're going to be talking about fashion's waste crisis. We're going to do that by looking at continental market and across Ghana as a case study. And as an organization, we've been focused on researching and advocating for the continental community since 2016 through our project that is called Dead White Man's Clothes which you'll hear a little bit more about soon. And quickly, just a last housekeeping thing, um, for referencing purposes, I also want to note that any data that's mentioned, quotes or photos are from us or foundation, unless they're otherwise stated and noted on the slide. I wanna begin by introducing you to Abena. Abena sells ladies tops in Contamanto. So pre-COVID times <laughs> when we could all gather in person, I would usually begin lectures like this with a video of Abena sorting and selling clothing. So I want to invite you to sort of try to imagine this with me. Um, in this video, Abena is opening a bale of secondhand goods and she's carefully inspecting each item, turning it over, looking at the seams, putting her hand inside to see what the quality of fabric is. She assigns it a value and then she puts it in a corresponding pile and starts marketing it just by shouting out prices. So two Ghana CD, three Ghana CD, 10 Ghana CD, whatever it is that she's decided it's worth. And she does this for you know, hours over and over and over again. And she will sell most of these tops for two Ghana CD, which is the equivalent of 35 US cents. Again, pre-COVID times, if we could all be together, I would typically come into a room carrying four bags of these jeans, each weighing around 40 pounds. I would plot them down while Abena's video runs, open the bags and start assembling this bale. This is Kevin. Kevin is a jeans bale that we brought back from Ghana in 2017. And it normally takes me about 25 minutes to assemble him. This bale of jeans was exported by Canada to Ghana, but factors, um, a lot of different factors tell me that these jeans were actually bought, worn and donated in the United States before being sent to Canada for sorting and ultimately being exported to Ghana. But of course, their journey started long before Ghana, before Canada, and before the United States, right? These 103 pairs of jeans were manufactured in 15 different countries, and the contents of this bale has traveled over 1 million miles. Today, Kevin just sits in my living room <laughs> as an artifact, basically, of the globalized fashion industry. And I begin my presentation with Abena and Kevin because inherent in the problems I will be discussing today is the fact that people like me have become the translators of other people's stories, of people like Abena. And that people like me can basically make art out of Kevin, um, while what I described to you is the daily labor of retailers like Abena, for whom clothing represents weight that she must assemble in the morning, try to sell during the day, and then disassemble every single evening. I have freedom of movement and can easily get a visa to visit and work in Ghana. Meanwhile, it would be incredibly difficult for Abena to ever get a visa to travel to or to work in the United States for research or for any other purpose. And herein lies kind of the first absurdity of excess, where in many ways, Kevin the Jean Fail actually has more freedom of movement than Abena. And in many ways, the conversation about waste and sustainability, at least the conversation that happens in the global north, is still really only focused on Kevin, on material, and really does very little to ask what sustainability looks like for someone like Abena. And that brings us to our first section, the invisible supply chain. So I wanna set the stage by talking about the scale of the waste crisis. The fashion industry produces between 100 billion and 150 billion garments a year globally. And most stats suggest that out of this, brands are only selling 80 billion a year. So this means that waste is built into the business model of fashion. And I compare Zara and ASOS here because just a few years ago, Zara was considered fast fashion for offering a couple hundred new styles every week. But today we have companies like ASOS offering up to 7,000 new styles per week. 
that's simply too much clothing. With overflowing closets, we simply aren't getting much use of the items that we own, right? There are some studies that suggest that we're wearing garments only seven times before we get rid of them. Ellen MacArthur Foundation believes that all of this adds up to one dump truck full of textiles being landfilled or burned every second somewhere in the world. Now, I do want to note, and um, you'll see I have this sort of misleading sign here. One of the most widely circulated statistics on waste, something that you've probably heard, says that Americans throw away 80 pounds of clothing per person per year. And I note that this is misleading because the statement is derived from EPA reports looking at MSW generation in total. MSW stands for municipal solid waste, and sources of MSW include residential waste and waste from commercial locations, such as malls and high streets. The point being that we lack data that reflects the difference between what individuals are throwing out and what fashion retailers are throwing out. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not sharing that caveat with you to sort of suggest that the problem is any less severe than these facts make it seem. But I do find it frustrating that brands landfill clothing without any data being captured on that. Um, anyone who works retail knows that many companies require you to destroy unsold goods, whether that's food, clothing, cosmetics, anything. Um, it's really wasteful practice, obviously, and also pretty abusive to workers. Um, to that end, I highly recommend that you follow Anna Sachs if you're not already following her. She's the trash walker on Instagram. She talks a lot about this part of the business. At the end of the day, and this is what we have, right? We produce more than we can consume, we consume more than we can use, and we waste as a result. I personally think that we need to focus a lot more on the production side of this equation because ultimately waste is a question of value. Fashion has become disposable because brands have made it so. A good example of that was in 2018 when H&M was sitting on $4.3 billion worth of unsold items. That's a lot of money, <laughs> but it wasn't um, really felt as a loss. It didn't impact the company. They still opened new stores that year, and generally they satisfied shareholders. What this means is that that $4.3 billion worth of unsold goods was not felt as a loss because the labor and resources used to make these garments had effectively no value. Next, let's talk about the dominant narrative surrounding secondhand clothing. So we mostly talk about secondhand in very simplistic terms, as inherently good, as inherently sustainable. The first way that this manifests is talking about it like charity. So we donate clothing to a charity shop or put it in a bin that has a charity logo on it. Essentially, it's this idea that someone somewhere needs what we no longer want. This automatically perpetuates a dynamic of superiority that is based on the deficit myth. And for years, we were basically told in the Global North that there's too much clothing here in the Global North and not enough clothing in places like Ghana, which is just simply false. Increasingly common today, we talk about the secondhand clothing economy as diversion, with local and national governments across the Global North setting really aggressive zero waste targets for their cities. These goals are important. Um, but it is unproductive to assume that waste is no longer waste as soon as it is not headed to landfills in the United States or in Europe. The waste still goes somewhere, and often it is going to landfills in other countries. Diversion claims basically amount to what is called NIMBY, which stands for not in my backyard, or this idea is that as long as it's out of sight, out of mind for me, then it doesn't exist. It's been diverted, you know, from my view, basically. The third way that the Global North talks about secondhand clothing is as quote unquote recycling. This is becoming more common because of circularity. More and more fashion companies are launching take back schemes where consumers can put clothing in a bin that is labeled recycling. And I think this is incredibly misleading. <laughs> the majority of the clothing collected through retailer take back schemes are not recycled, but rather enter the global secondhand clothing trade. And and generally, all three of these narratives suit those of us who live in the global north, right? And they're very convenient narratives for the fashion industry. Now, if you've donated clothing, chances are that you did so because you thought this was either environmentally friendly or socially responsible. Now, reuse is more sustainable than landfilling, but we also have to face the fact that most of us donate clothing to make room for new clothing. The cycle of donating the old and buying the new that's one reason why very little of what we donate actually stays in the global north. 
Charities can only manage to sell 10 to 20% of what they collect, and less than 1% of garments are recycled into new fiber for the fashion industry. But few of us have visibility into this, right? Few of us know what happens after the charity shop or the bin when we drop off our stuff. There are many roles within this invisible supply chain. There are the aggregators who collect, buy, and sell in bulk, and then there are the sorters. So clothing is sorted by category, sometimes upwards of 350 categories defined by garment type and quality. This is done manually. I was reading an article this week about one of the largest companies in the business. It's a company called iCollect or iCo, which is a subsidiary of a textile collector called SoX. They are the company that partners with brands like H&M to launch take back programs. So in this article, they were saying that employees sort through more than 6,000 pounds of clothing per eight hour shift. Um, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty uncomfortable. So after the sorters, there are brokers. Brokers sell across state and national borders. So just like Kevin the Jeans Bale, right, had kind of a roundabout journey, um, a lot of secondhand clothing from the United States might end up a few, in a few different countries before it's actually exported to its final destination. And then there are the textile recyclers, which textile recyclers today are mostly producing industrial rags and what we call shoddy. So shoddy is derived from a mechanical recycling process where clothing is shredded basically into stuffing. And shoddy is still used today for insulation. Um, but there was also once a really big market in the mattress industry. And I mentioned this because this market has basically been disrupted by direct to consumer mattress companies like Casper, which use foam instead of shoddy. This means that instead of selling clothing to shoddy producers, um, a lot of clothing aggregators actually have to pay the shoddy producers to take the clothing off of their hands. Um, and that means that a lot of this clothing just doesn't have a market. Some of it's sitting in warehouses across the United States. And then meanwhile, <laughs> we are now sending more mattresses to landfill. Um, there's, I, I mentioned all this because there is a massive need. If you're a designer that's tuning in, there's a need to create new business models for shoddy. And I would encourage you to that end to check out our friend, Elise. Uh, she has a company called Circle Earth. It's um, at crcl.earth on Instagram. And she's using shoddy for pillows and other soft goods. So all of the above, everything that I just described to you in this invisible supply chain, right? This can be both for-profit and nonprofit, and oftentimes it's a hybrid of the two. But regardless of how you donate, most of the clothing that is processed through this invisible supply chain will be exported for resale. The United States is the largest exporter of used clothing and Ghana is the second largest importer. I want to add to this narrative the fact that um, the sorting process in the global north has always you know, skimmed off the higher quality goods. So sometimes that's called the cream or the vintage whereas the lower quality stuff is then exported to the global south. And there's a you know, rising interest in the justification of thrift in the global north, and that's a very important conversation. But we also shouldn't treat this like a new conversation, right? The global north has been basically extracting the higher quality stuff for decades and then shipping the quote unquote inferior product to quote unquote developing countries. And I think one of the ways that this is most clear is looking at the afterlife of t-shirts. So one of the most common items that is exported to the Global South are t-shirts, but I'm you know, not talking about collector tees. It would be really rare to find a band tee or really anything that would sell well on Depop um, or a similar platform. Those you know, get scooped up by thrifters in the Global North. The t-shirts that end up in Ghana are what we call single use. So they're swag tees um, for specific events, marathons, conferences. They're typically very low quality because they are given out for free. <laughs> and single use tees simply don't do well in the secondhand economy because they're really context specific, right? Like folks in Ghana probably don't really care about your high school reunion or your pharmaceutical conference or even your sorority. And when scanning Confimento's stock, we see t-shirts that were exported from the United States 
um, that were clearly printed for events just three months prior, right? Because a lot of times the, the event date is printed on these. Um, within those three months, that t-shirt could have been, you know, gone through a really wild process. So it could have been, you know, tried to sell it on Depop, it could have been a flop on Depop, and then donated to one thrift store, sorted there, hung on the rack, passed over, sorted again, exported to a bigger thrift store in another state. Same process happens, you know, still passed over, then exported to Canada for final sorting, bailed up, and then exported to Ghana before it's going to be purchased by a retailer in Consumanto. And that's, you know, a lot of miles and effort for an object that few people really wanted in the first place. Now, all of this matters because the secondhand clothing economy is a supply chain, and it is the primary supply chain for millions of people around the world. And this brings us back to Contamanto, to where Abena works. So I'll start by trying to um, orient you to the space and to the history of Contamanto. So Contamanto started pretty small um, along a railroad. The secondhand trade existed under colonial rule, but it really wasn't until after independence that the city of Accra officially recognized Contamanto as a market. And this is a really fluid space, right? It continues to grow, even when you think Contamanto can't possibly expand, you come back and realize that a new section has just been built. Today, the retailer side of Contamanto is seven acres in size, and the importer side, which is right next to it, is about 15 acres. And this is believed to be the largest um, secondhand clothing market in West Africa. It's possibly the largest secondhand market in the world. There are at least 5,000 registered stalls and an estimated 30,000 people work here, many of them selling used clothing. Contamanto is in the middle of the city. So it's in the heart of Accra Central Business District. It's nestled between two large food markets. So there's a lot of traffic and thousands of people are here buying clothing every day, six days a week. It's very densely populated. You're almost never not touching a person or a pile of clothing. And so obviously there are people selling and buying clothing, but there's also so much more that happens here. There's music playing, radios playing, people dancing, people organizing around political views, people educating one another over loudspeakers, people are making things, there's cooking, cleaning, there's even bars in Contamanto if you know where to look, and plenty of places to sort of take a break and play pinball or chess. Here's a bird's eye view of Contamanto so you can um, better appreciate the size of that. That doesn't even actually capture the whole thing. So when all of the foreign clothing began pouring into Ghana, it was called Obruni Wawu, which is a phrase that translates to dead white man's clothes. Again, the secondhand trade and, um, and the version of Consumanto did exist under colonial rule, but it wasn't until the 60s that the trade really began to explode. And I think it's really important to look at what is happening in both the United States and Ghana at this time. So because the secondhand clothing trade, again, to us, is sort of presented as charity, it's important to understand that it's always been a for-profit venture that was born of fashion's excess. We found uh, records in the Ghana archives between the Ghana Trade Commission and secondhand dealers in the United States, specifically a company called Domsey Trading, which does still exist in Brooklyn. This community very clearly, or this communication really clearly lays out that this is a business opportunity for Domsey, right? Not charity. It's an opportunity to turn trash into cash. So why would this business explode during this time? And um, to break it down very simply, in the 1950s, American fashion companies wanted to find a way to keep customers coming into stores and buying, you know, clothes on credit. The first American indoor mall opened in 1956 in Minnesota, and the mall boom um, soon followed. And then one of the most pivotal moments in credit card history is what is called the Fresno drop, uh, where in 1958, Bank of America began mailing unsolicited credit cards to select markets in the United States. So throughout the 1960s and 1970s, credit cards became normalized, right? A piece of plastic allowed Americans to buy more clothing than they needed. Um, but if our closets were full, we might not continue to shop. So there had to be an outlet for this excess and this outlet became the secondhand clothing trade that again was marketed as charity. 
Meanwhile, Ghana gained independence in 1957. So because of colonization, wearing Western style clothing signaled proximity to power. And this greatly influenced how the secondhand clothing uh, was received. And Sammy and Chloe are going to speak a little bit more about this. I'll just say hi, everyone. Um, my name is Chloe Assam. I'm a women's wear designer um, and I'm a researcher. And this is. I am Samuel Loting. I'm also a fashion designer and a fashion researcher. And today, together, we're going to try and talk to you about um, the impact secondhand fast fashion and waste has on us. We often you know, hear people talking about why we are still allowing uh, a lot of you know, secondhand goods into the country or into mm -hmm. Cantamanto. But the issue is, it's not something that is just on the surface. It's not something you just put a stop to. Because if something becomes a culture and a tradition, it just don't go away. And that is what, you know, secondhand clothing and then waste coming mm -hmm. from the, the global north has become in Ghana. Because it's not something that just started now. It is something that started right from the colonial times. Mm -hmm. And this is because for, for another to colonize another, you need to basically take everything away, strip them down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. to zero, strip them down to their bones, and then take away everything that they are used to. So with the idea of um, colonialism, I mean, the White Falls came here, they took everything that we know, like mm -hmm. told us that this is not the right way to dress, or you need to dress a certain type of way to mm -hmm. fit in, or mm -hmm. to be great, or to mm -hmm. be accepted in society at the time. Mm -hmm. and. It, it got to a point where it made us devalue what it is that we know as our own way of clothing and our own way of dressing. That you have to dress like the colonial master in order to be accepted. And with time, people who were not privileged enough to afford what the colonial masters were wearing had to go in for hand down to second hand. And through that culture or through that repetitive tradition, it has become who we are right now. Because if you're a parent, mm. and even you as a parent, you don't feel comfortable um, wearing what you have made or wearing what you you grew up wearing because the white man tells you it's not right, yeah. you end up passing on to your kids and your kids pass yeah. on to their grandkids and their grandkids pass on to their grandkids. And mm -hmm. before you know, nobody really has that, you know, immediate appreciation for the kind of clothes or our own clothing. Mm -hmm. We want to know, have is second clothing or clothing from, from the West. And that has been the case until now. Yeah. So that really sets it apart how, you know, the idea of professional dressing and then you know, clothing from the West has become a big part of, of us as a people. Yeah, I think uh, to add to that, um, uh, it's not so easy, as you said. It's not a simple, like, just stop. Mm -hmm. It's a tradition that's been passed down over and over for generations. And I think the downside right now is that the way we do or produce clothing or the way not, uh, the, the Global North produce clothing has changed mm -hmm. exponentially. Like it, there's no, uh, it almost as if it's, there was no heart or thought and no offense because what we receive mm -hmm. or what we see in the second half market lately is just basically fast fashion. It, there's mm -hmm. nothing, um, there's nothing, how, how do I say, there's nothing connecting Mm -hmm. The way that our parents used to dress, even if it was secondhand uh, goods or even if it was um, hand-me-downs, it had a little bit of thought and quality to it, right? Right now, what we're used to is just um, basically shredded T-shirts, uh, fashion, basically fast, fast fashion waste, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's uh, my point. The point I was trying to make is it's not so simple. It's it's there's a lot of nuances that we need to unpack today that we need to talk yeah. about amongst each other that we need to be able to speak on certain platforms like this and share our thoughts and uh, our personal experience and sort of connect certain dots that if you're not in it, you will not be able to appreciate. It takes coming over, it takes sitting in it, it takes uh, interacting with it to be able to see those nuances um, and how they affect the way we um, interact with, what's it called, um, clothing. Anyway, so I'm just going to speak on how uh, another way is that these things have been handed down is through print and through media and through concept parties. You know, back in the day, again, I'm yeah. connecting the dots with colonialism, how back in yeah. the day, 
before you get on stage, you have to dress a certain way, you have to be a certain archetype of how um, you, you look approachable or you look like well put together or you look like um, uh, basically professional, how people, yeah. you, you look, the optics look good for TV or looks good for um, mm -hmm. broadcast, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like all of yeah. this has been passed down all over the years. And now the a version of that exists on social media. A version of that exists on our platforms, on our, um, and how and we are taking all of this into account. Remember, we are taking all of this yeah. into account. Yeah. So I'm guessing as one of the nuances we need to also address that it's, we're constantly being fed a certain way of dressing, we're constantly being fed a certain way of what is, is acceptable um unconsciously yeah. or consciously you're biased to what was originally yours or what was originally native mm -hmm. or contextual to your your part of the world or your culture so as sammy says you know one of the questions that we're asked most often is basically why why don't Ghanaians just stop imports of the second hand and this is you know an important question but Really, it just kind of erases the history and the nuance that Sammy and Chloe just spoke to and reduces the whole trade to one of, you know, supply and demand, um, which also assumes that supply and demand are neutral forces, which they are not. Um, this history, you know, very much is not neutral. And if we want to solve the fashion's waste crisis, then we're going to have to reckon, you know, with these colonial roots. All right, so now I will talk a little bit about the flow of material. So clothing comes in bales to the port of Tema, which is about an hour's drive from Contamanto when there's no traffic. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's much longer than that. Um, each bale of clothing weighs between 120 to 200 pounds. There are 400 bales in one container. So at 100 containers a week, there are roughly 15 million items unloaded in this market every single week. And the population of Ghana is just over 30 million people. So that's a lot of clothing. And in this picture, you can see the bales um, that were exported from all over the world. They're being sold by importers and retailers. And uh, they're being sold for anywhere from $75 to $500 a piece. And bales are valued based on two factors. So one is the type of garment, like men's suits or ladies' tops. And then two is the country of export. UK bales are the most expensive and they're considered the highest quality, whereas American and Canadian bales, um, these bales are the cheapest because they tend to have the lowest quality garments and American and Canadian bales are more likely to come with, you know, outright trash in them. So things like chip bags and bottles, um, things that aren't even clothing. So there are roughly 100 families who import most of the clothing coming into Contamanto. And the cost of purchasing the container varies widely, just like the cost of sales is varied. But I'm gonna talk about the high end. So on the high end, a container from the UK will cost between 35,000 to $40,000. And that's just the cost to purchase the container from the exporter in the global north. Next, it will cost the importer around $8,000 to clear the container at customs. So all in with fuel, you know, families are basically spending around $45,000 on the clothing by the time it is unloaded in their shop. And this is, you know, very different, I think, from what most people think happens when they drop off their clothing or donate it um, to Goodwill, for instance. So even though the container is expensive, most importers make really good money. Um, for a container from the UK, importers will make around 120,000 USD in revenue off of one container. So for the most part, importers are doing well financially, but they're still at the service of exporters in the global north. Um, availability and quality depends on what people in the global north are making, purchasing, and donating. Also, when importers get um, a packing list, when they get their final packing list, there's always going to be a little bit of waste on the container, whether that's in the form of these large sort of unsorted bales um, that have like again, literal trash <laughs> um, bottles, um, bags and stuff mixed in. Or it might be in the form of like 10 bales of winter coats. Um, so Ghana's on the equator. There is not that many people selling winter coats in Contamanto, and um, the importers will still end up with that on the container. So again, waste is built into this business model. 
Also of note is the fact that most of the importers are, um, or that many of the importers are not Ghanaian, and there is an increase in foreigners um, buying out Ghanaian families because this is where the money can be made. And this brings us back to Abena. Abena is a retailer, right? So she works six days a week. She leaves her home around 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning, and she travels an hour to get to Consumanto. She operates in what's known as like the new part of the market, which is female dominated and mostly newcomers to this business. Abena purchases new bales every Thursday, which is market day for importers. She buys ladies tops from the UK when business is good and ladies tops from Canada when business is not so good. Abena will always cut a new bale on retailer market days, which are Wednesdays and Saturdays. For Abena and most of these traders, buying these bales is an act of faith. Uh, when Abena buys a bale, she doesn't know if it will be good quality or not because the bales are compressed, right? They're covered in plastic and metal. When a bale is spoiled by food or a cigarette, which does happen, um, this leaves traders in big trouble. So retailers call their business a gambling business for this reason. And Abena always prays before she cuts open a bale. When she cuts the bale open, Abena immediately begins sorting it into four piles. These piles are called selections. First selection is comprised of dead stock. It's comprised of uh, items that were barely worn and then also some like really popular brands. First selection, a ladies top sell for about 10 Ghana CD, which is the equivalent of $2. And they make up the average of 18% of the bale. Second selection are things that are slightly worn, um, but still trending and in you know, good sizes. These sell for about five Ghana CD, which is the equivalent to $1. And they average 30% of the bale. Third selection, the stuff that looks you know, pretty worn, but it's not falling apart, that makes up an average of 46% of the bale. And then the fourth selection, which is also called the under or trash, these are items that are you know, really torn, have stains all over them. They're basically the things that aren't sellable. And this includes dead stock um, that has been intentionally flashed. So retailers need to recoup between 70 to 90% of the cost of their bail from first selection alone. And I think the scariest part is that Abena really has to make her money back in just 24 hours. Um, so why is that? Well, if you think about it from the perspective of a consumer, right? So if I'm a consumer, I'm going to come to the market looking for first selection. Like, why, why would I not want the best stuff? So if a consumer comes to a Benna and she's out of first selection, they're more likely to wait for the next market day when she cuts a new bale than they are to buy second and third selection. So throughout this whole process, there might be, you know, quite a bit of cash changing hands. But Abena is lucky if she makes around $10 a week in profit. This is often not enough money to cover all of her expenses, things like school fees, cell phone credit, electricity, food, water, transportation. Um, and you might be wondering, you know, who's buying the stuff from Abena? Who's shopping at Consumanto? In short, you know, everyone across age, uh, gender, profession, shop secondhand. And the two reasons are, you know, one, secondhand is very cheap. Two, because there is a lot of variety. Um, but even more important than who is shopping, I think, is the way that people shop. And Sammy and Chloe are going to speak more on that. Now, to touch on how we interact with clothing, like, as a, in our native clothing, let me be precise. So we, we weave and we tie dye and we batik and we do a lot of these. Um, really rich, we produce a lot of these rich, vibrant color fabric. And we value it so much that certain clothing, you do not wear them often. You don't wear them all the time and you only wear them at special occasions, right? That speaks to how we really genuinely interact with clothing, clothing that is ours. Yeah. But clothing that has been forced on us or have been perpetrated that is professional or, I don't know, political correct or it fits a certain mold, mm -hmm. over the years has evolved into something that is disposable. Yeah. But genuinely, as a people, we do not. We really um, take 
good care of our fabrics. We hardly ever uh, throw our own indigenous fabrics out mm -hmm. and we pass them down um, generations onto generations. So the question that I'm trying to ask is, um, how different is um, our approach to shopping from the approach of the global north to shopping? Albeit they are, the, 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 the e-commerce or general market is fast paced and everyone is buying and just things are like that. How different is that from what we're doing and what are the nuances that you'd be, you be able to uh, speak on? Okay, so I will take this from the angle of sustainability. So we often hear, I mean, sustainability is, 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 is the trend. <laughs> yeah, everyone is talking trend. about that. Supposed, we've been doing it, it's right? Supposed to be, it's supposed <laughs> to be a way of life, not just a trend. So, yeah. Um, I, I will take it from that angle. I mean, everybody's talking about sustainability now, sustainability in fashion now. And for me, it's not something that we as Africans, like culturally, we be something that is new to us, something that we need to learn. Because for a very long time, we have had like a very close sentimental relation with our clothing. It's mm. not just a commodity and it's not just something disposable. Because um, the, for the everyday Ghanaian, even now to make clothes, they go to town to select their fabric. They interact with the, 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 the fabric seller or the weaver or whoever it is that's making oh, the product. Yeah, for them. absolutely. They interact. They choose the colors they want. So right from the beginning, whoever is wearing it has been part of the entire procedure of the clothing making. So they go to whoever the weaver is or whoever is selling the fabrics, they pick the color they want. They take it to whoever the tailor or the dressmaker is. There's the dress is, the measurement is taken. They take part in picking what style. Or that's what even an intimate design. process. I think that's even exactly. an intimate so, process that really affects the way you, you interact with your clothing. It's something exactly. that was so made, tailored to you. It's just... And never mind, so continue. There's, there's a whole there's a whole sentimental, like deep relation with the like the garment right from the beginning, right from the beginning, like from the textile to when it was made to when it was worn. And then through this process, like when these clothes are made, because you're so part of you're very much part of it, is usually made and like most often made in the highest quality. And yeah. if you make clothes like that, it has so much sentiments that you want to pass it on to, your, to whoever, yeah, is, whoever. To whoever is there. And then there, is, there isn't this idea, because most clothes are like tailor-made and custom-made, there's also this relation, even when it comes to second clothing, that people go to the market thinking of, okay, today I want like a, like a, a dress that looks this way. So I can go to um, Cantamanto or the second-hand market, buy what I need, come home, and have it custom-made or tailored or altered to mm -hmm. my fit. Yeah. So there's this like interaction with clothing like among us that is very different from what we see in the global north. Cause yeah. it's more like in the global north, I think clothing is seen mostly as a commodity and a disposable one. So yeah. there isn't really a relation to it. I mean, here I still go to my mom's wardrobe and like she can tell me, like she can pick a dress, tell me everywhere she's wanted to. Yeah. Lady, where she bought the yeah. from. Yeah. Basically, knows how long she's had it. Story and the history. How long she's had it. She knows the story and the history of the garment that she has. And then even me as a designer, when in my first year of of, of uh, fashion school, most mm -hmm. of the collections and the pieces that I worked on all came from like um, old dresses from my mom's wardrobe. And then she would yeah. tell me like how delicate I should be. Sometimes even when I'm cutting, she has to watch me because she feels like there's so much value in those dresses that I don't have to cut it anyhow. So that's yes. how much we <laughs> as Africans culture. I know that we so appreciate, well. We appreciate the clothing because it's not just clothing, it's culture. It's part of us. Yeah. So that sets the difference between how yeah. we relate to clothing and how the global north relate to clothing. I think, you know, what they shared is so important, right? Because this is not the average experience that most of us, you know, have if we're shopping in the United States or Europe. The bespoke tailoring experience is, you know, really quite limited, maybe if you're having your wedding dress made or something like that. Um, and I think this really shapes our relationship with fashion. Um, related to what Sammy and Chloe just shared um, is the larger truth that Consumanto is a hub of what the Global North now calls sustainability. So the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is a leading circular economy think tank, they reported that doubling the number of times a garment is worn could lower fashion greenhouse gas emissions by roughly 44% and 
and technology enabled resale platforms, you know, around the world, like ThreadUp, they're attracting investors and, you know, a lot of media attention globally for their work in this space. But Consumanto is responsible for extending the life of far more garments than any resale platform in the United States. So for comparison, ThreadUp's 2020 report states that they have recirculated 100 million items total, and ThreadUp um, was started in 2009. By comparison, Consumanto recirculates 100 million items every four months. So Consumanto is also a model of sustainability because it's not simply a place to buy clothing. Um, on the contrary, you know, Consumanto is also a design studio and really a factory all in one. So clothing is constantly being rethought and reworked at all levels. There are tailors and seamstresses, there are screen printers, there's a whole section of the market that's really dedicated to over dyeing. And then there are also people there to iron, mend, and wash clothing. And then there are many entrepreneurs, um, designers, and curators who upcycle items from Consumanto. And I've listed you know, three um, really great examples here. So the Revival is a platform and event series where the founders really educate about sustainability through the process of co-creating upcycled collections with the public. And their upcycling events, you know, are they're just the best. <laughs> they're bursting with positive energy. They're 100% community-centered. They're really the best upcycling events or fashion events generally that I've been to in my whole life. Um, second, I want to highlight the Slum Studio. So the founder, Cell, um, he's an artist, and he really approaches upcycling as applied research. So he uses a lot of color and symbols to tell the story of the market through the clothing itself. Um, and his work you know, is also very community-centered. And then third, I wanted to mention D45, which is an experimental retail environment, a styling library, and then also an event space. So the founder, Maui, he rehabilitates a lot of different items from Consumanto, including accessories, so a lot of jewelry, hats, and sunglasses. And each item, you know, is really transformed from something that few people even really notice when they're walking through Consumanto into something that's really unique. Um, everyone who goes to D45 walks away with items that they're going to cherish for a lifetime. Um, and you know, I, I really wanted to highlight this because we're always asked if designers in Ghana upcycled away from Consumanto. And yeah, <laughs> pretty much every designer is upcycling stuff from Consumanto, right? It's the culture to do so. Um, it's not really a trend. And I think that a lot of designers in Ghana are doing more than their fair share to clean up fashion's waste crisis. Um, so I hope you'll, you know, follow them and support them. At the same time as this incredible upcycling work is going on, we do have to acknowledge that the secondhand clothing um, trade does depress the local textile and fashion industry. And Sammy and Chloe will speak a little bit about that. I want to talk about how um, it affects us personally as creatives. You want to go ahead and then I'll start. Uh, I'll continue from you. Yeah. So. Um... One thing that I know when it comes to these things, as I said before, like the whole idea of colonialism is to strip people away from what they know mm -hmm. or their way of life in order to control them. And I mean, if it goes down to, you know, as being taken away from what we know as a, our, as a people, our culture, our way of dress mm -hmm. becomes a norm, it makes it difficult for you to even trust in your own creativity or your own line of making clothes because you feel like that is not what, what that is not what represents what is good or what is accepted in the, mm. in the society so it goes a long way i mean right now in the crisis <laughs> but the internet um was not really our friend there but to add to what Sammy was saying about the impacts of the colonial gaze on creativity and designer agency there's also the impact of colonialism on infrastructure. So the scramble for Africa, you know, divided um, people across the continent into colonies, but few of them were settler colonies. Most were extraction sites. And the colonial project, you know, was very much also a project of capitalism. And so the goal was really, you know, to take valuable resources, export them, and turn them into profit. So West Africa inherited these arbitrary political boundaries as well as colonial infrastructure set up to physically move stuff out of the country. So colonialism not only disrupted intercontinental trade, but it developed Ghana to trade with the global North, not with surrounding nations. 
And this legacy, you know, obviously makes it difficult for Ghanaian designers to trade across the region, although a lot of people are working hard to change this. Um, and meanwhile, you know, designers like Sammy and Chloe, they talk about diluting their ideas because basically to be successful, they have to be featured in a Western magazine and typically paid in exposure, of course. Um, and to survive, many Ghanaian designers will need to sell their work on foreign retail platforms. So the secondhand clothing trade just reinforces the cycle of exploitation and dependence. And this brings us to our next section. So despite the efforts of consumantos, retailers, dyers, <laughs> tailors, upcyclers, and consumers, not all of the clothing can be sold. So remember, there's 15 million items unloaded in this one market every week, and only 30 million people living in Ghana. And secondhand clothing markets, right, they're, they're not retail utopias, where every item is going to be sold, where every item is going to be reused and diverted from landfill. At the end of the day, our research found that 40% of the clothing flowing through Consumanto will leave the market as waste, and that's usually within a week of landing at port. So clothing waste from Consumanto is handled in two ways. One is formally by the government, and then the second is informally by individuals. I'm going to sort of talk about the formal first. So the local government, the AMA, they pick up 70 tons of clothing waste from Consumanto every day. This is the largest consolidated point of waste for all of Accra and this you know, is not Ghana's waste. So the 70 tons a day was being dumped in Pone landfill. Pone was built to be a sanitary or modern landfill, meaning that it's supposed to have a liner that stops leach it, which is you know, like a fancy term for a garbage juice, stops the leach it from entering the surrounding environment. The waste is supposed to be compressed and covered daily so that there's no pests. And it's supposed to have pipes that allow methane gas um, that, comes from decomposition to escape, which would reduce the you know, impact or the risk of fire and explosions. It's also supposed to be illegal for waste pickers to work on a sanitary landfill. But everything that I just described to you, that's a luxury. You know, Sanitary landfills that comply with all of these standards are pretty much exclusive to the global north because sanitary landfills are really expensive. And waste management is often the single highest budget item for local administrators in low-income countries. Pone was financed by the World Bank, and when they were making plans, they didn't account for foreign waste, um, things like secondhand clothing. So as a result, Pone filled up four years ahead of schedule. And the Ghanaian government is paying for all of this, right? So the, the Accra Metropolitan Assembly spends over $100,000 a year on tipping fees alone to dispose of only a portion of the secondhand clothing waste that's generated by Consumanto. And you know, that's money that could have gone into education or healthcare. So because of the overflowing amount of waste, Pone actually caught on fire in August 2019, um, and the site had been unusable since. This is footage from the fire. Um, I happened to be there that day. But in this video, you can see hundreds of waste pickers you know, kind of scrambling to roll bags of recovered plastic and wire out of the fire's path and down the hill. Um, and while they're doing this, you know, they're breathing in noxious fumes. They were literally risking their lives to recover um, plastic bottles. Secondhand clothing from Consumanto alone represents 20% of the planned capacity of this landfill. And this is much higher than what we have in the United States where textile waste represents under 8% of the landfill. So Solomon Noy, the head of waste management for Accra, he believes that the secondhand clothing waste is actually what was responsible for Consumanto catching on fire. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details, but there is a video um, on our Instagram and on our um, website that you can check out, a full interview with Solomon explaining this. But most importantly, we need to understand that clothing causes very specific challenges for Solomon and for waste management. So first, clothing wraps around compactor trucks, which often causes breakdowns. Those breakdowns cost money. And it also means that compactor trucks tend to avoid um, these piles of secondhand clothing, which leads to basically uneven compression. Second, clothing soaks up all sorts of stuff, right? <laughs> it carries with it a lot of silt from Consumanto, and then it soaks up leach it um, in the landfill and kind of creates this toxic um, cap on the landfill. Lastly, clothing waste makes it harder for waste pickers to do their job. So there are over 500 members of the Pone Waste Pickers Association, and they reduce the landfill waste by up to 30% by recovering plastics and metal for recycling. 
When they are rocking around on the dump site, waste pickers say that not only does the clothing have no value to them, but it actually causes them to trip and fall, um, which can cause serious injury and even death. Um, I also want to note that most of the plastic bottles recovered by the waste pickers at Pone and throughout Ghana, they're exported to be turned into recycled PET textiles by companies in the global north. Yes, it is good, you know, that these bottles are being diverted from landfill, but there's a lot of different issues with this process. So, you know, one, it's dangerous labor and there's not an adequate safety net. Waste pickers really um, are discriminated against and their work is not respected locally or on the global stage. Second is the scenario of um, the value add, so the profit, right? All of this continues to be concentrated in the global north if we're exporting plastic bottles and turning it into recycled PUP there. Um, if these bottles are going to be recycled, it would make a lot more sense if this was to happen in Ghana, benefit the local economy, um, but instead, again, they're being exported and sort of extracted as a raw resource. Lastly, many people in Ghana, you know, don't have access to clean drinking water, so bottled water is actually more necessary than it is in other parts of the world. So it's even more absurd then that these bottles are extracted from Ghana and turned into recycled BD textiles that will then shed microfibers into our global water supply, especially when you know, Ghana could really benefit from local bottle recycling. Meanwhile, even before Pwn exploded, most of the, most of the clothing um, coming from Consumanso never went to landfill uh, because the AMA doesn't have the budget or the trucks to transport all of the clothing waste that is generated each day. So some of this waste will be swept into the open gutter system where you know, it tangles around itself and also leads to um, public health crises, increases the risk of malaria and cholera. Once in the sea, some of the clothing is washed up on the beaches where it will then be burned um, because there's no landfill to take it to. Still more will end up on the ocean floor where it will catch on fishermen's nets and leach microfibers and chemicals from the dye. The fish themselves are also you know, presumably full of microfibers. Um, and the truth is that no one really knows exactly how much harm this clothing is doing to the marine environment. Um, that is something we're trying to learn more about. In January 2020, we conducted a research-based beach cleanup. It took us four hours with a team of 40 people to recover just 600 garments. So it might seem like a lot <laughs> to you, but that's really just one to two bales worth of clothing. And it took us this long because garments were heavy, um, tangled, and you know, bloated with sand, and the sand inside had actually turned black. And um, so in this video, um, basically of what you see here, we think this is basically a fraction of what's lying on the sea floor. And the clothing also gets buried in the sand, right? So during the beach cleanup, people were digging over six feet down into the sand and still finding these tangled masses of clothing. And then there is still more clothing waste than goes to landfill or the ocean. The remaining waste from Consumanzo is dumped in informal settlements. This is a photo of a 30-foot dump that is over 60% clothing waste. And this clothing dump is located in an informal settlement called Old Fatima, which, is rough, which um, has roughly 80,000 people who live there, um, some of them working at Consumanto. So this waste is in people's backyards, right? It's, it's children play here and cattle graze here. This waste does more than cause environmental destruction. Um, it is used to further disenfranchise vulnerable populations, and basically to shame people living in poverty um, and to erase um, and destroy physical property. So waste clearly has a negative impact on Accra's environment, but there are also social impacts. So this is a photo of a retailer taken after she opened a bale and found that it was spoiled with over 70% of the contents covered in mold. So she can't take this bale back to the American exporter, right? She can't return it. And, and so she's stuck with that loss. Our research shows that less than 20% of Consanto's retailers are actually making a profit. So yes, many people have created a job for themselves through Consanto, um, but many also tell us that this is a job that is becoming less dignified. Um, those who have been in the trade for over 10 years say that today the business is dirty and it's high risk. Um, in the last four years, you know, we've met thousands of retailers and not a single one wants their children to take over the business, which is a pretty big deal since many of these stalls have been in families for generations. The burden. So one of the most essential roles in Consumanto is that of the Kaye. Um, Kaye means female headboarder. 
Contamantas Calle, some are very young. Um, they transport bales of clothing between importers and retailers, and then they also transport some of the clothing waste. So each bale weighs, again, 120 to 200 pounds. So this is often their entire body weight, if not heavier. Um, traveling, you know, a mile or more, they're paid between 30 cents to $1 per trip, and that's barely enough to cover their daily expenses. This labor is backbreaking. Uh, many Kaye are injured when bales fall and break their limbs. Some actually die um, because their necks break under the weight of the bales. Most of these girls and women you know, are migrating from rural environments in northern Ghana to Accra, um, whether they're on a mission to save money for school, to send funds back home, or to raise money to start a family. The challenges these women face as Kaye make it really difficult for them to survive, um, let alone to sort of transcend their situation. And again, their labor is necessary for Consumanto to function which means that their labor is necessary to fulfill, you know, the reuse, charity, recycling, and diversion goals that are set um, by brands and clothing collectors in the global north. The last social impact of waste that I want to cover is debt. Um, so as you have learned today, retailers pay a lot of money for bales, and they often take out loans to do so. So this puts them in a precarious position. On December 15th, 2020, um, just, you know, a week before Christmas, a fire destroyed part of Contamanto. 200 retailers and tailors were impacted. Their shops burnt to the ground. Many of them lost $5,000 um, or more in goods. And you know, 2020 was a hard year for everyone, including folks in Contamanto. And so more retailers had taken out loans than ever before. And they were really counting on Christmas as a time when they would break even or make a small profit. And instead, the fire you know, plunged them further into debt. So most of the clothing that ends up in Consmanto comes from, you know, the same brands that canceled orders during the pandemic, leaving garment workers to starve. And these brands, you know, they're indebted to garment workers. Garment workers. And then you have folks in Consmanto, retailers, who are going into debt to try to buy bales full of clothing from these same brands. Um, I, you know, this is absurd. And it's also very violent. Um, we are currently raising funds to support the people who are impacted by the fire as they work to rebuild their livelihoods. Um, we're raising $40,000, which will end up being $200 to 200 people. Um, that's really modest, um, but we think that it's a goal we can reach. So if you can, you know, please consider donating and sharing the fundraiser. Um, the link is there on the slide. So before I move on to the next section, I you know, really cannot stress enough that Consumanto is not a story about waste. So Consumanto is a story of sustainability, of community, of resilience, of ingenuity, of collectivism, of DIY urbanism. The waste is a byproduct of the story. So the waste exists because of the accumulated exploitation and injustice that happens long before clothing reaches Consumanto. I have shown you horrifying images of waste and, you know, this is something that has to be dealt with. But we also have to, you know, understand that Ghanaian citizens generate far less waste than any person um, in the global north. So Ghana just doesn't have a landfill to put it in, to hide it away. So what really um, the service that Ghana has, you know, has providing us in terms of just our education is that Ghana makes visible the problem, um, but Ghana is not the problem. So fashion today operates on a linear, um, within a linear economy, right? So a take make waste economic model, but the circular economy is becoming a really hot topic in fashion and for good reason, because it proposes an alternative to a linear economy and we desperately need such alternatives. Um, the circular economy framework, if you're not familiar, um, it basically aspires to create a closed loop industry with the goal of designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use as long as possible and regenerating natural systems. And I think all of this is really positive. Um, I also believe that a materials-based framework is insufficient to tackle fashion, fashion's waste crisis because again, waste is a byproduct of injustice. Waste um, is not just a material problem. So big brands are embracing circularity, right? The, Brands that are responsible for most of the waste that's ending up on Ghana's beaches are the same brands that are investing the most in circular initiatives. So brands like H&M. 
And this may seem positive, um, it might seem like they're taking responsibility, but they're also really setting the agenda here. So circularity is being led by the titans of the linear fashion industry, and they're kind of twisting this narrative to suit them, right? Twisting it so that the circular economy allows for limitless growth. And materials-based sustainability frameworks, you know, I think are really attractive to brands because they're simpler. They're <laughs> much simpler than an intersectional framework. It is much easier to you know, deal with Kevin, the genes failed, than it is to transform the circumstances that trap retailers like Abena in debt slavery. So simply replacing raw resources with waste resource you know, isn't going to solve the problem, at least not on its own. We also have to think about the labor involved in the circular economy, what jobs are going to be created, and will people even want those jobs? Now, multiple brand representatives have told me that Contamanto could be a future gold mine of waste. Um, I've also heard countless designers refer to waste as gold on webinars and IG lives over the past year. Um, when a brand tells me that they see Contamanto as a future gold mine, what they mean is that you know, when fiber to fiber recycling is at scale in the global north, they will be able to leverage the nearly free labor of Contamanto's workforce to sort of sort and extract that clothing waste and then turn it into value-add products in the global north. So essentially they see Ghana as a source of cheap labor and as an extraction site um, with profit continuing to be concentrated in the global north. So this ideology, right, of, of waste being a gold mine, this ideology is about preservation. Um, it's not about revolution. Um, and as an aside, I do want to mention because I think it's very funny, um, the photo here, is a collection of items that were recovered from landfill in January, 2020. And included in this are briquettes of shredded cash. Um, so actually shredded money that we found at the landfill. So in short, you know, justice will not be the inevitable byproduct of take back programs or clothing donations or recycling technology. If we want sustainability to have anything to do with justice, which you know, I hope that we all do, then we have to be explicit about what that looks like. So part of justice is reckoning with the exploitation and colonial power dynamics at the root of fashion waste crisis. Um, today, circular initiatives really are not very global in perspective. The Global North is essentially kind of rebranding much of the good work that's being done by the Consumanto community and communities like it. And I think there's a lot of sort of uncritical conversations around sort of modern solutions that are happening in the global north and a lack of solidarity between those, again, quote unquote, modern solutions and quote unquote, traditional markets like Contamanto that really just only perpetuates colonial power dynamics um, and don't get us very far to actually solving the problem. So I believe we have a choice. You know, waste will either be the next frontier of colonialism and greenwashing, or waste will serve as an opportunity for greater reckoning and for reparation. All right, our last section. I know we're running over, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to speak slowly. Um, so how do we begin this reckoning? First, we need a new culture around waste, right? So one of the main problems with the circular economy rhetoric, at least as I see it in fashion, is that there is so much focus on future solutions and so little focus on cleaning up the mess that currently exists. Like The Global North needs to clean up its mess. But there is no way around this. Um, and cleaning up our mess, you know, can start with just taking responsibility for the waste that you're creating, whether that's um, in your home or I think, you know, designer, designer studios, fashion programs. Um, we've done a lot of work with fashion programs to that regard, and it's really effective. Um, but one way that we can form a better relationship with waste is to learn from the example that Consumanto has set. So Sammy and Chloe really explained, you know, how they have an intimate relationship with clothing production. Um, you know, start to form this intimate relationship with clothing by taking your measurements. It's simple, but it's important. Um, and we need to turn our malls and high streets, I think, into hubs of creativity to be as much like Consumanto as possible <laughs> with tailors, dyers, upcyclers um, in the stores themselves. And I think trying to do this in a way that's accessible and not elite. Um, and then, you know, if you're donating clothing, also shopping secondhand is important. Um, but most importantly, you know, we need a new mental um, relationship with waste. So again, waste makes visible humanity's separation from nature. Um, if you think about it, we're the only species that creates waste. And this is actually really painful, I think, to, for people to face. 
Um, I've been talking about waste for over 10 years now, and <laughs> there's a lot of shame around it and a lot of pain for this reason. Um, but this is why we need to rethink our relationship, right? We need to stop trying to turn it into gold for a minute and just ask ourselves what waste makes visible to us. What can we learn from it? And then lastly, you know, in the global north, I think this key is, you know, practicing some humility, especially around sustainability and circularity. Um, I think upcycling is a really good example. You know, there's been a lot of articles over the last year celebrating designers in the global north for upcycling because of the limits imposed by the pandemic. And this is really great. I'm a big fan of upcycling. Um, but we also need to recognize you know, that most designers in Ghana have been upcycling their entire careers because of limits that are imposed by the legacy of colonialism. Um, so I think humility and solidarity, again, are really key here. And then also simply acknowledging the colonial legacy of the secondhand clothing trade would be a really good place to start <laughs> to shifting the culture around circularity. We also do need policy. Um, so there are basically two options available to us right now. One is a ban and the second is EPR policies. So the conversation around secondhand clothing bans are always about imports. And we just um, did a long sort of like explainer post on our Instagram that you should definitely check out about this. But basically people always ask us why Ghana doesn't ban um, secondhand clothing imports. But not once in the last five years has a single person ever asked me why the United States or Europe doesn't ban exports. Um, and I think that's really odd, you know, because the, the problem is not in Ghana. The problem is in the global north. Um, and I bring that up because it wouldn't be any easier for Ghana to get rid of Continental than it would be for the United States to ban exports. So I think we need to understand that and stop expecting, you know, people on the receiving end to put a stop to it. And we all need to really play our part. EPR policies. EPR stands for Extended Producer Responsibility. Um, which would basically require that brands pay a small fee. Um, sometimes that's even just a penny per garment that they produce. This money would then be used to finance waste management. Um, the idea being that we're holding, you know, textile producers responsible for collection, reuse, and recycling. So EPR policies are being considered by many countries, including the UK and the USA. Um, but so far, the only EPR textile policy um, that we have in the world was established in France, and that was in 2007. And the issue with EPR policies is that they allow for continued exploitation of waste. So France has exported more than 40% of the post-consumer textiles that they collect to African countries. And none of that money that's collected through EPR actually goes to support markets like Consumanto, where the waste will ultimately be handled, um, which you know really isn't fair and I think is not very effective. So Personally, I think that EPR policies have promised that only if these policies are global in scope and only if they include ecological reparations that fund circular economy industries in places like Ghana. Um, we also you know, cannot talk about regulating the waste stream if we're not regulating what is produced in the first place. Um, we absolutely need to set standards around durability. We also need to require that brands pay garment workers a living wage. Um, and to that end, you know, hopefully a lot of you are already following the pay-up movement, um, but definitely if you're not, please do follow them and sign the petition. And lastly, we need to stop calling the secondhand clothing economy recycling, right? Um, we need to be clear about what this is, and I think um, break down the nuances for the public and tell the truth. Um, and one of the most important steps towards true circularity would be requiring transparency, traceability, and accountability across this reverse supply chain that already exists. Um, and with all of the above policy considerations, you know, most important I think is, is just stop, <laughs> we need to stop treating the continent of Africa kind of as an afterthought or like a footnote um, in this research and in articles about um, circularity. I think Africa really should be the first thought, not our last thought. And I know that many of you are probably wondering, you know, where should I donate my clothes now? <laughs> Is there an ethical way to donate? Um, and there are steps that you can take, um, but instead of asking that question, I would suggest that you consider new questions um, that are less about waste as material and more about the root causes of waste. So again, questions like, 
is this brand scale sustainable? Is this garment worthy of a second life? Is this garment worthy of the person who will be receiving it? And what does waste make visible to me? Um, we all know the traditional three R's, right? <laughs> Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Unfortunately, these don't seem to be enough um, to catalyze the cultural revolution that we need, um, which is why our organization suggests trying out another set of R's, reckoning, recovery, and reparation. So basically, you know, we want to strengthen the good work that's already happening in Contamanto. Um, to us, this looks like catalyzing what we call a justice-led circular economy, which we define as having you know, these three characteristics that you see on the slide. Um, for us, you know, essentially, when it comes to circularity, Contamanto is doing the best job with the lowest quality products um, and zero support. So imagine what Contamanto could do with you know, some investment, the investment that they deserve and the respect that they're owed. A justice-led circular economy will prioritize the prosperity of those who have carried the burden for far too long. The key word here being prioritizes. As an organization, we are focused on manifesting this vision through three different focal points. So one is building a recycling cooperative uh, where the technology is made locally, can be maintained locally, also can be owned locally. Um, and we're very much at the beginning stages of this, but it's really exciting. And then two is working with the CAIA to create a food sovereignty program. And we're working to basically build out what we call a circle of care. Um, much of the work that Chloe does involves creating a peer network and sort of support system for CAIA that then um, transitions into apprenticeship. And then third is advocacy, you know, which looks like continued resource or research. We um, produce a lot of media resources but it's also pushing for ecological reparations and creating a secondhand solidarity fund to ensure that retailers are no longer going into debt um, just to buy the Global North trash. And I'm going to give the final word to Sammy and Chloe, and then we can take your questions. Thank you for your piece. The whole conversation I feel like we've been having today, it's, it's about spelling out those nuances and spelling out mm -hmm. the complexities that make uh, Cantamanto's ecosystem on how it's not so like black and white, but there are certain things you, you can do as a consumer, as a designer, as a creative to offset some of the trash yeah. that is left yeah. Um, yeah. behind. Anyway, just, yeah, just, it's been so... Yell on his head. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's been so fun talking to you. It's always so nice to talk to you about yeah. these things. <laughs> and I'm hoping... Um, our conversation spoke to a lot of people who are going to be watching it and maybe take mm. some notes and it would um, give them some insights as to what we're dealing with and how it really yeah. has a negative side and a positive side and how we each have to take ownership of yeah. the part that we play, whether it's a consumer, yeah. as a creative, a designer, whether it's a fast fashion brand, whether it's an ultra fast fashion brand, how we all add to the compound problem. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's it. Do you have any last words before we go? Yeah, there's the, the one last thing I would like to add is the fact that um, whoever is watching this or wherever you're, you're watching this from, you should know that none of this is isolated. It has a way of connecting to us all in a way, even if it's not connected to you directly. It has a way of affecting your life in one way or another. So let's be more attentive to these issues and let, let's know, let us know that just because, as, as um, Chloe quoted, just because it's not in our backyard, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's doesn't not, mean it's not, not an yeah. issue. It's connected yeah. to us all. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> okay, this is a question from Sela Foster that has come up and from multiple people as well. She's asking if secondhand clothing has potential to be part of the solution for sustainability and slowing down fashion purchases, how can we restructure it so that it acknowledges colonialism and actively works against it? Is denouncing it the only way? Thanks for your question. Um, so one thing, the little thing I, the little thing I would say is the first thing is for us to acknowledge the issues of waste and how much it's costing us all. And um, I think when you start to change your mindset to that tune, it is it, the, the first beginning of the whole conversation of the whole idea of like moving towards, towards this direction. 
and denouncing is definitely not the way because um if you watch the lecture or you listen to what Liz said earlier it has come to a, a long way it has become part of how we live our lives now so denouncing it will be just covering all the the problems or sweeping all the issues under the rug without really like understanding or accepting the issue that is really going on so i think for me the first thing is for, for us to do is like actively know that all of these things is connected it's connected to colonialism it's connected to to you know neocolonialism and everything else you basically answered the question i i think that the first step is to acknowledging as you said um seeing and um yeah, again acknowledging the part that we each play and once we see how much of a of an impact uh, it has not just on um, the global south and how much ownership we need to um, take, it becomes a bit simple. It's not just about denouncing, it's about, okay, this is what I have to do to be able to uh, make sure um, I don't have so, so much footprint or I'm not buying so much clothes or I'm not um, consuming so much. It's just the um, awareness goes a long way to um, helping us have discussions, conversations, align, aligning the nuances and um, yeah, yeah, sort of having compound solutions to it. That's what I have to say. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, a little bit more I would add is um, from the lecture, Liz was talking about how, you know, Cantamanto is not a problem. And then the issue is coming from the global north with overconsuming, overproduction and everything. And I feel if secondhand is definitely has the potential of being part of the solution for sustainability. But the thing is, if you are someone who is going to donate, and I think Liz touched on this, if you're going to donate and the government is not something with you wearing it's not something that you yourself are ever going, is ever going to wear or it's not something you would ever give to you know your loved one why would you want to donate it to somebody else so i think this is also something you should think of because the idea of of second hand is not you know just waste because i feel most people give us these clothes without thinking of where it's going. They think they're donating yeah. it, but that's just what they are thinking. Just get rid of it, not necessarily donating. Because I feel if you're actually doing it as donating or as an act of kindness, you will think of the product or the garment or the piece of clothes that you're giving out there. So this goes a long way of appreciating how or acknowledging how, like what happens to the garment after it's left your wardrobe or it's left your, your room or your house. Yeah, what Sammy's saying is so important because the reality is, and, and this might not be you personally, but a lot of people don't wash their things before they donate them. A lot of stuff that gets donated, you know, is torn, is really faded. And that's just, that. <laughs> there's so much clothing in the world that, I mean, no one needs clothing um, to the degree that they're going to want something like that. Um, the least we can do is wash things. So when you donate it to a charity, you might think that they're washing it, um, but they're ex they they don't wash it before they're going to export it. Great. I think I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, we'll be sharing all the resources shared in class, as well as the contact information and Instagram uh, profiles of Liz, the Or Foundation, Chloe, and Sammy. Um, thank you, everyone for coming today and engaging with us in such a thoughtful way. Um, thank you, Liz, Chloe, and Sammy. This was so insightful. Um, and yeah, everyone in thank the chat. You. Like, thank, thank you, you for Love us. Factory. And thank, thank you so, so much. much, everyone. Thank you for engaging and again, for your patience. Um, so I really appreciate it. Have a thank you. Day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.